Hello students, welcome to chapter two of Kotler's Developing Marketing Strategies and Plans. Um, this chapter will deal with the subject of strategy and how you go about planning. Um, this chapter will cover from the mission statement to the development of the SWOT analysis, discussion of value and how does marketing help to both create and acquire value for the consumer and ultimately how does it relate to success in the business. So without further ado let us move on very quickly and one of the things to realize is that the task of any business quite simply is to develop or deliver value at a profit. Now it's kind of important to once again state that value, or excuse me, profit is one of those things that although it is important, does the marketer in his heart necessarily deal with that at all times? And the truth of the answer is that marketers really focus on value and it's in the focus of value ultimately that's how you determine whether or not it's profits. My the chair of marketing um, at Louisiana Tech, um, Barry Babin at the time, um, had a great discussion and I was going on in marketing theory class with this classic definition that part of what a marketing does is that we you know develop value and create profits at a reasonable rate of return and one of the things that he kind of snapped back at me was is that you let the accountants worry about the profits what we do is we identify and deliver value and let me tell you I got it okay and so what we're going to first start with is we're going to talk about how do we go about delivering value um, the concept of the core competencies and then we'll talk about the central role of strategic planning and the first thing we want to start with is is that in the value delivery process we're actually talking about the active homework that marketers do um, before any product exists and that when we're trying to generate a value for the consumers and so there's kind of three steps and the steps basically are conferred with the concept of segmentation targeting and positioning and so what our first task is is to choose the value and and basically it is based on the consumers needs and desires what makes that particular product so valuable and desirable one of the classic things that Theodore Levitt talked about in the 60s about marketing is that when a consumer wants to go in and get a quarter inch drill he doesn't want a quarter inch drill he's looking for a quarter inch hole all right and and so what marketers must do is always focus on the needs and the desires of what consumers wish and so this is the segmentation process where we're looking at the needs of consumers and in that way separating them into common like groups and so that's the first the next is is providing the value and so based upon that target market the process of targeting that's when we decide what is those mix of features and the prices and the distribution that consumers are going to desire in that particular product itself and the last is is communicating the values and this very much is how marketing announces and promotes the product and its consumer benefits. Um, this is the process of positioning, especially when we must understand that positioning is where that particular product is unique in the consumer's mind relative to the competition. Marketers always consider our competitors because ultimately it is the things that make us unique that are what consumers wish when they're purchasing a product okay remember this and it's important to understand if there's no difference between your price or excuse me your product and another one there's only one way that consumers choose they choose by price and so let's talk about the whole concept of what core competencies are all right in a master's class um, if you're taking an MBA, 
one of the things that you're going to get hit over the head with constantly is this concept of what's known as the core competencies. So what does this mean? What is it about your particular product, your particular corporation that is unique and that is special? Whatever those things are, those are what are considered your core competencies. They are a source of competitive advantage. They make a significant contribution to what the consumers perceive as the benefits and that also apply in a wide variety of markets. Let's say that you're in the service industry. Let's just say that for the lack of a better thought you're in plumbing. Let's say you come in and you do the job and your jobs are good and they never they never break and you never have to come back and be able to you know fix it again well your core competency is the trust of knowing that your job is always going to be right and it's always going to be fixed when it is something that is difficult for competitors to imitate that's what's considered to be a strategic competitive advantage one that isn't able to be replaced one that consumers always believe and will it come to you again and again for. Um, one of the things about Starbucks is that Starbucks makes a darn good cup of coffee. All right, let's just say that right out. Um, when Starbucks came out, you started to see a lot of other coffee houses come up because the truth of the matter is, is that if you have the right equipment, and you have the right beans, how hard is it to make a good cup of coffee? And the answer is no, not necessarily. And so as a core competency, which is a support, uh, as a competitive advantage, there's a certain amount of weakness there. I always thought in my own mind that Starbucks could have broadened um, their particular market by coming out with a newer, edgier, you know, younger kind of coffee house for uh, for younger individuals, even in the Gen Z range now, and in essence compete against themselves, and I think they'd have done quite well. Um, having said that, um, the important thing about Starbucks is not just the coffee that they make, but in the atmospheres that they create inside their stores. Those are the things that are difficult for other consumers to be able to copy, or excuse me, corporations to be able to copy. That is a source of their competitive advantage. It is the ambiance, it is the atmospherics, it is the ability to go into a particular Starbucks store and kind of glom that. Now, Let's also say this, that the coffee itself, when people take out, there's a smell to a Starbucks coffee, there's a special uniqueness to it. It's no wonder that when you order coffee that they put your name on it, all right? Because putting your name on it identifies it as being unique. And so this is what a core competency is. Something that isn't easily replicated, difficult for competitors to Im imitate. It is a competitive advantage when it is difficult to copy, but when it's nearly impossible, it's a strategic advantage. And so, when we're trying to maximize the core competencies, basically what we're hoping to do is that the core competencies define who you are as a corporation, all right? They shape the business scope of who you are, and they position the company's brand identity, those unique things about you. One of the things for decades is Cadillac had some of the finest engineered automobiles in the world, no doubt about it. Um, unfortunately, in the 70s and even worse in the 80s, General Motors came up with what was known as the unibody. And so what it meant is that instead of having to design unique automobiles for each brand that they carried, which was Chevrolet, Buick, Pontiac, and Cadillac at the time, what they would do is create one body and in essence allow all of those particular cars to use those unique bodies. It was a horrible idea and it, it basically culminated I believe with the Cadillac Sierra which was basically a Chevy Nova with a fancy design. Anyway, 
Cadillac in the late 90s decided they had to do something or they weren't survivors as a corporation and they came out with a Cadillac CTS and with that they repositioned the company's brand idea created an, a or let's just say a redefinition of the core concept between to find engineering design and Cadillac went on to be successful to this day so having said that how do we go about looking to plan for success? Well, we do what is known as strategic planning, okay? It's impossible, it's important also to understand that depending on the size of the organization, you might have more than one corporation under a big logo. Just as we talked about General Motors had four divisions, Chevrolet, Buick, Pontiac, and Cadillac, other organizations such as Procter & Gamble, Disney of course is the big one, those each have a unique kind of smaller um, area or a smaller group that they work with. And each one of those individuals, if I were to look at Disney, you could look at ESPN, you could look at Disney Films, you could look at Disney Entertainment, Disney Stores, um, oh my gosh, what am I thinking of? Disney Theme Parks, ABC, um, all of those, each is a unique unit and that's what are known as strategic business units and so when we think about planning we're thinking about planning that generally goes on in four levels you talk about a growing or the planning at the corporate level which is at the very top you talk about at the division level which would be to the effect let's just say Disney media you could think about the individual business units ABC ESPN, Disney Channel, and then finally at the lowest level you'd think of the individual product, okay? Marvel action figures, that would be an example. Each one of those is responsible for some ultimate higher corporate mission that is going on, but each one of them has their own unique plan. And so to achieve the overall objectives, each individual corporation, or excuse me, each business unit has to have their own individual goals as well. So, the central instrument for directing and coordinating marketing effort is what is known as the marketing plan. In this study, we're going to talk about how you go about making a marketing plan. We'll talk about the importance of diagnosis and synthesis when it comes to thinking logically through the facts. Um, we'll also talk about how do we go about building the plan in a fit, an official document. But we're also going to talk about two things in, in particular, and that is known as strategic planning and tactical planning, all right? In marketing, the strategic plan lays out the target markets, the firm's value proposition, it looks and analyzes the market for the best opportunities, it thinks of things in a scope beyond just be a single year, all right? And it is different from the mission statement, and we'll talk about those differences later, in, in, re, in key aspects because it is specific and it is measurable as well. Specific because it talks about expectations and measurable because it helps us to define whether we've achieved success or not. The tactical plan is based upon the features, the promotion, the four P's. How do we carry out the day-to-day -day operations to achieve the strategic planning goals? And so, to use that as a metaphor, let's look at two individuals in the United States during World War II, Patton and Eisenhower. All right? Now, Despite what you may have ever read about these, these two individuals were actually friends, all right? They were very different in scope, but they were go joined together on as, as the same mission, which was to achieve victory um, over, over Nazi Germany, all right? And so 
Patton, excuse me, Eisenhower is a very unique individual. When they were looking for one person to be able to manage the uh, invasion of Europe, they leapfrog past 31 other individuals and they chose Dwight Douglas Eisenhower. It's kind of a unique thing when you think about it. He was 32nd in line and yet he came to the forefront. Well, why? Well, because Eisenhower was known as a very strategic planner. He was known for an individual who could look at the big picture, who could bring disparated forces together. He was known to be someone who could talk not only to the Americans, but talk to the British and the French and the Polish and the Austrians and, and the Italians and all of the Allied forces together and be able to bring to a single consensus, consensus the Canadians and the Scotch feud and the Irish feud, excuse me, I don't mean to in, did not include anyone, but he was able to bring all of these disparated individuals together and have them work to achieve a common goal. He was truly a strategic planner. Patton, however, was known as a tactical planner. And what does that mean? Quite simply, it's this, is that in order to achieve the goal, you needed someone who, in the day-to-day -day operations, could go out there and make those goals happen. And that was certainly what Patton did. Patton was part of the great fake-out. And so it was basically thought by the Germans that it was Patton who was going to lead the army and he was going to leave from Calais, or to Calais, which was the shortest distance uh, over the English Channel. Once they were in Europe, it was Patton who led the Fourth Army and who achieved those enormous successes, and he was basically driven by the goals that he was given to him from Eisenhower. When the Battle of the Bulge came out, in which the Germans made this enormous advance through the Ardennes and ultimately into the, um, into the Siege of Bastogne, um, it was Patton who Eisenhower turned to in this time. The interesting thing about it is that Patton had been planning one week before to relieve Bastogne because he could see what was happening. And so in Patton, who had moved south through France, did a I guess you would call it not a 180, but a 270, made an enormous pivot left, and in less than two, or excuse me, in less than three days, in 50 hours, he was relieving Bastogne. And so, what this basically means is, is that you need both strategic planning, the long-term goals to achieve success, and then you also need those individual short-term goals that achieve the, the basic goals that strategic planning hopefully lead you to achieve, okay? All right, so excuse me, I will talk about Walt Disney in a second, all right? So now you see where we're going. Strategic and tactical, all right? Now, what we're going to talk about, I didn't want you, Walt, go away. Now, it's important to understand that along with strategy and tactics, you need or the process in order to make this achieve success, along with the strategic planning, is the ability of organizing and implementing the goals themselves. And so as we talked about in the planning stage of strategy, you start at the corporate plan, you work to the division, the business, and finally the product planning, and everything does flow downward. And of course it flows upward and downward as well. Once you plan those things, then you must go about organizing and implementing those by finding those divisions and those individuals who must do those things that have both the authority and the responsibility to do them and then ultimately what you want to be able to do is measure the results, diagnose the issues, those things that cre created success, those things that created failure, and then take some corrective action and those things go through a process to where you replan and you re-implement and ultimately what you hope to do is you hope to achieve some success. So, how do we go about planning? Well, the first thing that we have to do 
is just as we need a top-down approach from strategy and tactics, we have to first think about what we're in business for. And so the process is, is we define the corporate mission. What are we in business for? We establish the separate individual business units, the strategic business units, and what their purposes are. We go about assigning the resources to each strategic business unit so that they can achieve their grow of their their goals and we assess the opportunities for growth in them as well all right now the first step defining the corporate mission sounds simple but it is one of those things that many corporations never do it sounds simple but has many companies actually stopped and thought to yourself, what are we in business for? And who is our customer? And what value do we bring to them? And, and what should our business be? It sounds simple and perhaps a little bit naive, but you would be surprised that many times that corporations don't simply do this. And if you don't start on the right foot, the difficulty is, is that you don't know or won't understand who your business go who who your business um, caters to. What are the assets of your business, and what are you in business for? Many times, especially with small to medium-sized corporations, they're usually the will of one individual, and as long as that individual drives the company, that 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 there is a goal and a purpose for being around. Well, unfortunately, what can happen is, is many times, is you have what's known as mission creep. And mission creep basically states is, I'll go do something else and add something to, to the things that I do. And ultimately, it means that I might be able to grab more customers. But what it means also is that the possibility is, is that you're committing assets to a business that you yourself are not familiar with, and you may in essence chase good money after bad. So when you ask yourself what kind of business and who is my customer, the important thing also to understand is your orientation. Now we're going to talk separately on another video um, about Theodore Levitt and the discussion of marketing myopia. In 1960 when Theodore Levitt came out with his article in the Harvard Business Review, it it, in many ways it created a firestorm of thought in marketing. It was a seminal moment in which marketing kind of paused and made it rethink itself as a corporation. And it was a good, good point. And one of the things that he did was is that he said that many corporations carry in themselves this view that they're in business to make products, all right? And then the truth is, what they are there for is to provide some value to the consumer. And so for them, defining yourself to the market that you're in, or for marketing, it, it's a better and a longer term uh, way of doing business, especially if you're in the corporate, uh, in the customer satisfying product uh, uh, process. Well, the reason why is the pro the problem is is that pro products are transient. All right, that basic needs that consumers have will will endure forever. And so, if you look at this rubric right here, the Missouri Pacific Railroad, in the, you look at their original purpose. Their, their point is is that they run a railroad. Well, the truth is is that if they orient themselves toward the consumers, um, they find that they're actually in the people and goods moving industry, all right, and that that's their job. If you look at Xerox, they're not in the making of copying equipment. They're there to improve office productivity. Standard oil, yes, they sell gasoline, but their more important way of looking at their value is that they supply energy. And then finally, if you look at Columbia uh, Pictures, they're not in the movie business, they're in the entertainment business. And if you shift those things towards the markets that you're in, then ultimately you're defining yourself by the desires that consumers have, and those desires never end. So, 
um, a discussion. Um, one of the things that Microsoft focused on and Target fascinated on was the Windows operating system. In 2007, 2008, Windows owned something to the effect of 92% of all of the operating systems on computers and like devices. Here in 2021 now, they're, um, they're, um, their their footprint is less than a third of all of those devices. Why? Well, because they changed the platform. Um, we went away from just desktop units to not only laptops, but also handheld devices, iPads, smartphones, and quite simply, Microsoft being targeted on their products never moved when they should have. And, and now they're playing catch-up and they're in the game somewhat, but they never developed their product for the market uh, or for the consumers. And so this is one of the reasons why they're chasing after Google and they're chasing after Apple. So the first thing is a mission statement. All right. What is a good mission statement? Well, a mission statement is a carefully thought out description. It basically is something of a vision that you can share with your corporation and with consumers and it talks about your company's purpose, your direction, and the opportunities that are, you, that are in front of you. Um, it would provide direction for 10 to 20 years and hopefully even indefinitely, all right? And so a good mission statement focuses on a limited number of goals. It stresses the company's policies and the values that the corporation has. It talks about what are the competitive spheres in which the organization works at, and they take the long-term view. And the last thing about a good mission statement is that it's short, memorable, and meaningful. And so, now we can finally talk about Walt Disney. Okay, so Walt Disney, um, after World War II, Walt Disney was a very busy man. Walt Disney, however, had two daughters, all right? And for Walt, every Saturday was Daddy's Day. And so Walt would take his two girls out and they would go somewhere where they could spend time together. And so Walt Disney, invariably, if you're in Los Angeles, you go to Griffith Park. And invariably, what would also happen is that Walt Disney, they would eventually make it to the merry-go-round. And so Walt would go on the merry-go-round for a couple of times and he'd sit and, you know, he'd watch the girls and he would think to himself, Himself, while he was sitting there, this is nice, but I wish that there was something else that more that adults and children can go together and, and to have more fun. And in that moment, sitting there on Griffith Park is where Walt Disney got the idea of Disneyland. Now, one of the other things that Walt did was is that he, he wasn't just sure if it was going to be like any amusement park. That's not what Walt wanted. You know, he was looking for an idea, and he found that when he visited parks in Belgium and I believe Austria as well, and what he liked about those parks is that they had a theme, that they had a purpose or direction. And so what he wanted was a park that had a theme, a theme park. And so what he did was, when he developed Disneyland, what he wanted it to do is kind of encompass the United States or the history of the U U.S. And so we had one section which talked about, you know, the early parts of the United States, and that's frontier land. And he had another one that you kind of talked to, you know, the adventures, the, the things of people coming overseas to the United States, and that was adventure land. But he also wanted to speak to the future and, and ultimately where the United States would go, and that was Tomorrowland. And then what he finally did was he pulled it all together into a central section that was called Main Street USA. And it was his thoughts of what Main Street was like at the turn of the 19th century. And so, Walt came up with a mission statement. The admission statement was a place where adults and children can go together to explore fun and knowledge. Okay? Now, it's a 
wonderful short clip and it's a mission statement and it is perfect if you want to think of it. It is short, it is memorable, it is meaningful, and it takes the long view. Think about it. As, as children and adults move through time, all right, fun and knowledge, those things may change, the things that we enjoy. But if we use that in the long-term goal, as long as we find out the things that we enjoy, that are fun and knowledgeable, as long as we follow that pathway, we'll always be leading to success. And this is an example of a really good mission statement. Okay? All right. Okay, so as I've said, you need a limited number of goals, short, memorable, and meaningful. Those are what make good mission statements. The next is, as I've said, is that you establish these strategic business units. These are single businesses or a collection of related businesses. They usually have their own unique set of competitors. They, they have a leader that is responsible for the strategic planning, but each one is a unique organization unto itself. And so if I were to look at Disney Channel, and I were to look at ESPN, and I were to look at ABC, each one of those they're, in essence, in some ways, competitors with each other. They're single businesses, they're and they're actually a collection of related businesses. Each one of those organizations has their own leader responsible for their own profitability, and each one of those is managed in their own way. Upper management has to decide how to go about allocating those resources for each unit, and this is the concept of what's known as portfolio planning. And so each one of those organizations has someone that is in charge of planning how they go about and how achieving their goals.